So good morning to everyone. Uh, we are at the new ISM chat. I have the pleasure to have here Professor Han from London. Um, who will discuss with us some uh, issues, let's say hematological issues to be a little bit wide related to COVID-19. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, my first question is, can you share with intensivists a little bit about pathophysiology of uh, thrombotic complication in COVID-19? We have seen many thrombotic complications in hospitalized patients who have COVID-19. Uh, and we have also seen, I think, an increased number of deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary emboli in people who have had mild COVID uh, and people in lockdown who have taken no exercise uh, and are very immobile, uh, suffering from seated immobility syndrome. But coming back to hospitalized COVID, we are talking about patients who are hypoxic and who have COVID pneumonia. And we know that the pneumonia uh, is causing an incredible inflammatory response. The histopathology shows large numbers of lymphocytes and macrophages. And we know that lots of cytokines are being produced, especially interleukin-1 and interleukin-6. And they are asking the liver to produce an acute phase response. And so we see very prothrombotic acute phase changes with COVID. And in our lab and in your lab, the fibrinogen levels are normally two to four grams per litre. And we are seeing median levels of eight uh, in the patients who are, have got COVID and who are having mechanical ventilation. So very marked levels of fibrinogen, factor eight, von Willebrand factor, all the other coagulation proteins are greatly increased. Uh, platelets are activated. And in fact, if you look at any mechanism involved in thrombosis, it's activated in COVID. Uh, we have recently published our data. We've looked at patients who went onto ECMO with COVID and compared them over the last eight years with patients who also had a viral pneumonia who also needed ECMO. And we do um, a CTPA before we start ECMO. And what we found was that those who had COVID have significantly greater higher rates of pulmonary emboli and immunothrombosis, need to come back to that later. And when they come off ECMO, we always look at the legs or the Doppler and they have significantly higher rates of DVT than other viral pneumonia. So I think we have to say that COVID-19 produces the most prothrombotic state we have ever seen with a viral pneumonia. And do you agree that this is true, of course, because you discussed some venous, venous thrombosis, but it is also true for arterial thrombosis? Yes, so we know that if you have an inflammatory response, you'll have higher rates of arterial events. And yes, we see higher rates of arterial events. I haven't seen, though, a comparison between arterial events due to COVID compared with other uh, viral pneumonias yet. Um, in terms of uh, pathophysiology, I have just a specific question, because as an intensivist, we are working on microcirculation endothelium in other diseases like sepsis. Is it also this endothelial dysfunction a main driver of this uh, thrombotic complication? Well, it depends how interested you are in the endothelium as to whether you think it, it's, it's the main driver. I think it is a, dri a driver. Uh, and we know that COVID can enter through the ACE2 receptors into the endothelium. So it's one of the uh, major drivers with the acute phase response, but which is the most significant one, I think it's difficult to say. Um, I think we need to talk about the two pathologies going on in the lungs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I, I, so I, though we have got these high rates of deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary emboli, we also have what you intensivists have known about for a very long time is, and um, we clutters weren't fully awake to it, was that if you have acute respiratory distress syndrome, you will get microvascular thrombosis within the sites of really bad inflammation. 
Uh, and so we see this with COVID. Our study showed that this was higher than any other viral pneumonia. And I think that one of the lessons learned from COVID is that all of the early publications uh, last spring and summer from all the many centers saying there's really high rates of venous thromboembolism with COVID. We're actually counting venous thromboembolism and immunothrombosis. Because if you have immunothrombosis, it will show up on a CTPA with a segmental or subsegmental change because you'll get with the microvascular thrombosis, you'll get damming back of the blood uh, into the arterial. So that, that is how they show up. And if you look at the underlying rate of DVT and PA, we've still got five to 10% of patients in critical care with COVID getting true DVT uh, and PA. Can I ask you, so this was very clear for pathophysiology. Now, if we look at potential intervention, everyone thinks about anticoagulants. But should we think at the combination with also immunomodulators? Because as you said, it's a, a complex part of physiology, it's also including immunothrombosis. If we go right back and think, what is the point of coagulation? Well, actually, it's the effector system of the immune response. So loads of inflammation, as you do in Bechet's or vasculitides or acute respiratory distress syndrome, you're getting micro vascular thrombosis. So if you could remove the inflammation, which hopefully we are doing with dexamethasone, one would hope you would see less immunothrombosis. And from all of the work on dexamethasone, I have yet to see a study where they've looked at the endpoint of, so how many patients got immunothrombosis? I suspect that's quite difficult to do because we're using uh, dexamethasone on the wards and we're preventing them from progressing to go to critical care. And maybe we're selecting out those that aren't so responsive to dexamethasone and they have a worse outcome uh, going to critical care. I think you have to give the answer to that, not me. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, so, can you, Sorry, can I ask you whether you think that this complex pathophysiology also can explain some of the hemorrhagic complications we observe in these patients. Because in the ICU, of course, for many reasons outside COVID, we observe a lot of bleeding in these patients. Could it be a quite common pathophysiology, again, microvascular injury? If you're getting areas of necrosis, which you are, then you may well erode into an arterial and get bleeding. So I would imagine that is probably a major driver for the hemorrhage in the lungs. Okay. I have another question, which is a little bit more complex for intensivists, but not for you, of course. Um, COVID is quite a complex disease, and we do not only observe coagulation problems. Uh, we have heard about some other hematological complication, for example, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, uh, macrophages activation syndrome. Are these, let's say, not say frequent, but how the intensivists should look at, which are some drivers or some input where they are quite rare hematological dysfunction that should trigger like additional investigation. For example, very high ferritin levels, which are disproportionate comparing to the dimers and for example, uh, CRP or you know, unexpected anemia or thrombopenia on admission. So, so macrophage activation syndrome, I think most people are very aware of it, and we see it quite commonly in critical care. Uh, rather than anywhere else. And yes, they have, I mean, with COVID, you get very, very high levels of ferritin, uh, and then you can get extraordinary high levels of ferritin with uh, macrophage activation syndrome. Although they may be associated with COVID, we would tend to treat those cases as any other case of macrophage activation syndrome. So we would give steroids and we used to pyramate. And uh, I am... I hand them over to my colleagues who are doing malignant hematology and well used to using topiramate. So, th so they usually manage them. Very clear. Thanks a lot. I have a very last question. We um, haven't discussed thromboprophylaxis. 
No, we didn't. But maybe because you know of the limited time we have, I have to stick to some question. And of course, we can meet yeah. the next time for a second interview. But that's the so, most important because let's just do thromboprophylaxis because thromboprophylaxis at the start of the pandemic, intensivists were seeing so many thrombosis and picking up immunothrombosis. So it tended to give more and more heparin uh, as thromboprophylaxis. Some even gave therapeutic heparin as thromboprophylaxis. And we have now the interim, interim results from remap cap and attack uh, and active four saying that actually it's not helpful. Uh, there was no increased survival uh, in giving therapeutic anticoagulation compared with standard of care, which was either intermediate or standard dose thromboprophylaxis. And also those patients bled significantly more than other groups. So I think it's very important with this chat that we put across this pr problem that we should not be using therapeutic anticoagulation in COVID patients for thromboprophylaxis. Very important, as you said. So now I have my last question because I know you're much involved in vaccination in UK and I have a question. Um, imagine that you have in the ICU and you will receive a patient with a suspected related thrombotic complication with vaccination. For example, we heard a lot about, you know, cerebral venous thrombosis. Is there a particular issue for intensivists to be known in terms of a management? Of course, we identify the complication in terms of management and therapy. As we heard about, you know, autoimmune phenomenon, should we consider therapies for an autoimmune phenomenon as we do it in other diseases? So this is another immune response. So the post-vaccine thrombosis that we're seeing, we call vaccine-induced immune thrombosis and thrombocytopenia. So it's really important. All have antibodies to platelet factor four, which is the same as heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So this is an immune response and we need to treat it as an immune response really aggressively with uh, intravenous gamma globulin as fast as possible to try and ameliorate the antibodies, dilute them down and block their effects through the FC receptor. And then the second issue is, oh my goodness, this is very similar to heparin induced thrombosis we should not be using heparin. So we are using our Gatraban right up front. Uh, you can use Fontopyranox, you could use a direct oral anticoagulant, depending on the condition of the patient. In intensive care, you probably want to start with Ogatraban. And then you have the problem on top is, well, their platelet count may only be 20. And you don't want to give them platelets because that might exacerbate the problem. So you need to get the intravenous gamma globulin as in as quickly as possible, that will help push the platelet count up so you can give the anticoagulation. And then there's another problem because quite often they have a low fibrinogen with a really, really high D-dimer, higher than you've seen with COVID. Uh, and so suggesting that there's some fibrinolytic switch on, we, we, we don't know yet, but we tend to give them fibrinogen to keep their fibrinogen above 1.5 uh, so that they tend not to bleed as much uh, without it. So quite complex care. You need to look at the living guidance on the British Society for Hematology website. We update it two or three times a week, we have a group and we discuss all the UK cases and we learn from every case uh, and it's really helping us to reduce the mortality. I really have to thank you for the very uh, interesting and, uh, and very clear uh, response you give to my questions. Uh, so uh, of course I wish you the best for the work that you do and I hope you to see you soon for the next interview. Bye. Thank you. Bye.